Hey everybody, welcome to Standard Deviant School, Shakespeare. I'm Herschel Bleefeld. Today's program, Introduction to Shakespeare. You know, a lot of people love and enjoy Shakespeare's plays, but just as many people complain, they don't get Shakespeare. That's not surprising. Shakespeare can be really tough to handle, but that's where we come in. We'll teach you Shakespeare like it's never been taught before. Here's our standard deviance approach to Shakespeare. First, we'll take a trip into the life and times of Shakespeare. Then we'll give you the scoop on Shakespeare's use of language. And finally, we'll discuss how Elizabethan drama differs from our drama today. So without further ado, I give you Shakespeare. The standard deviants have enlisted the help of Shakespeare professors and experts in preparing this program. Hello, I'm Hazlitt Granville Beckerman, famous Shakespearean scholar. I've dedicated my life to studying his plays. You may not love Shakespeare as much as I do, but with a little bit of help, you can learn to understand and appreciate his work. There are as many ways to approach and interpret Shakespeare as there are Shakespeare scholars. You may agree with the interpretations in our program, and you may disagree with some of them. That's okay. The important thing is to start thinking about the plays and discovering all the great things they contain. We hope our approach will give you a good foundation to develop your own ideas about the plays. Now let's start things off by finding out about the life of the man whom fellow British playwright and bestest buddy Ben Jonson described as not for an age, but for all time. Shakespeare. Shakespeare was born in England in 1564 and died in 1616. He lived and wrote during a time known as the English Renaissance, the period during the reigns of the Tudors and the early Stuarts. This general period is known as the Elizabethan era, after Queen Elizabeth I. The English Renaissance was a time of immense creativity in culture and the arts, which drew upon the classical world, especially the Roman with ancient dramatists and poets influencing the English Renaissance. Shakespeare grew up in Stratford-on-Avon, a small English town, then made his way to London, where he hooked up with an acting company. Now, theater in those days was a lot different from what we're used to today. First off, actors weren't exactly highly regarded, falling in the social strata somewhere between pauper and assistant pauper. To put it simply, acting wasn't exactly the most respectable position around. Shakespeare was a member of one of these theatrical companies, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, who by the turn of the century were performing at the famous Globe Theatre on the banks of the Thames River in London. The Globe Theatre was a lot different from the theatres of today. Shaped sort of like an O, the Globe was a three-story wooden theatre with an open roof in the centre over the stage. Each floor had a gallery with seats for the audience. The centre area, known as the Pit, was where the masses watched the plays. Because they stood on the bare ground for the duration of the performances, these theatre-goers were known as groundlings. These groundlings ate hazelnuts all day and, quite frankly, smelled bad. We resent that remark. Yeah. Why, I bathed just last coronation, I did. He did. I did, I did. The stage of the globe extended partway into the audience and had a trap door in the middle. Behind the stage, dressing rooms were concealed and a tower, known as the penthouse, stood atop the thatched roof. Since this was before the days of electricity, performances were held outside during the day, under the sky, usually lasting about three hours without an intermission. Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, later known as the King's Men, also sometimes performed at indoor theaters. The company also performed before the court of Queen Elizabeth and later King James, usually during holidays and special occasions. Oh, and another thing about Elizabethan theater, no women actors appeared on stage. Young boys played the female roles instead. You know, it's true. In Shakespeare's day, it was considered improper for women to appear on stage. So female roles like that of Cordelia, Ophelia, and Juliet were played by young boys. Does this make me look fat? Shakespeare wrote plays that were performed at the Globe. Shakespeare wasn't just a playwright. He was also an actor and a shareholder in the company that owned the Globe. Excuse me. My name is Francis Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon. A famous author and philosopher. I was also a close personal friend of Queen Elizabeth's. 
Some people think that I wrote all of these famous plays, not this Shakespeare guy. It makes sense. I was an educated nobleman and I knew all about the royalty that Shakespeare wrote about. So when you talk about Shakespeare, remember me. Excuse me, Governor. Begging your pardon, Mr. Bacon, sir, but how did your genius ship die? I... Uh, I died of bronchitis. I was testing new theories of refrigeration. Uh, I died of bronchitis after killing a chicken and stuffing it with snow. Pay no attention to Mr. Bacon. He was a towering figure in Elizabethan England, but he didn't write Shakespeare's plays and he's still a little miffed about the way he died. Anyway, during his time as a dramatist in London, Shakespeare wrote comedies like A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Comedy of Errors, history plays, all those Richards and Henrys, the Roman plays like Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, and the romances, which include Cymbeline and The Tempest, and of course, the tragedies. Here then is a general timeline of Shakespeare's life and works. He was born probably on April 23, 1564 in Stratford. By 1589, when he was 25, he had settled in London. His first plays are difficult to date, but they include Richard III, The Comedy of Errors, Titus Andronicus, his first tragedy, The Taming of the Shrew, and Henry VI, parts 1, 2, and 3. You see, even Shakespeare wrote sequels. Now in 1592, due to an outbreak of the plague, all the theaters in London were closed down for two years. Shakespeare took advantage of this break to write two book-length poems. Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece. By 1594, Shakespeare was back writing for the stage, completing Love's Labor's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, and King John in the next two years. <clears throat> Between 1596 and 1603, when Queen Elizabeth died, he continued to churn out plays, including The Merchant of Venice, Henry V, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, and Twelfth Night. Somewhere in this time, the 1590s, Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, which were a series of love poems that solidified his reputation as a great poet. After the turn of the century, 1603 to be exact, King James became the new ruler of England, and for Shakespeare, the hits just kept it coming. Between 1603 and 1608, he wrote several plays, including the great tragedies Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, and Antony and Cleopatra. After that, Shakespeare took it relatively easy. From 1608 to 1613, he wrote his last plays, including The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. After this time, the playwright retired, moved back to Stratford, and just lived the life of a country gentleman. He died on April 23, 1616. He was 52 years old. Let's review. The playwright and poet William Shakespeare was born in Stratford-on-Avon, England in 1564 and died there in 1616. He lived and wrote during the English Renaissance, also known as the Elizabethan era, after Queen Elizabeth I. In London, Shakespeare was a member of the Lord Chamberlain's Men, for whom he wrote plays, many of which were performed at the Globe Theatre. The Globe Theatre was a three-storied, open-air wooden theatre shaped like an O. Plays were performed during the daytime to take advantage of the daylight. Also, boys played the female roles. In addition to writing some of the most famous plays ever created, like Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream, William Shakespeare wrote two book-length poems and scores of sonnets. Not a bad life's work, eh? Now we'll look a little bit closer at Shakespeare's work, starting with his use of language. Shakespeare was a master of the English language, but how exactly did he use the language? Well, for that we need to look at some terms. First off, you should know that Shakespeare wrote in both poetry and prose. Poetry is concentrated language, produced through rhythm and sound. Poetry is a heightened form of language, so it's different from the way people normally talk. Sometimes poetry is called verse. Prose is a lot different. For one thing, it's the language of everyday speech, the ordinary language we would use when speaking or writing. An example of poetry would be these famous lines from one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. And an example of prose is, get some bread and milk when you go to the store. Let's discuss poetry a bit more, why don't we? Oh, don't worry, we'll get in out quickly and nobody will get hurt. Our first point, the poetry Shakespeare used is metrical writing, which means, well, it means that poetry uses something called meter. Meter is the use of a regular rhythmic pattern in language. Like in this line from Shakespeare's play, Richard III. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. 
You see, there's a rhythm to the language when you speak it. The poetry Shakespeare wrote for his plays was in blank verse, a form that usually uses a metrical pattern known as unrhymed iambic pentameter. Though this is a complex term, the concept is fairly straightforward. First off, unrhyme just means that the words at the end of the line don't rhyme. Now, an iam is a unit of speech that contains one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. A stressed syllable is one we place emphasis on when we speak. And quite logically, an unstressed syllable is one we don't place emphasis on. Okay, to help you out, let's go back to that line from Richard III. A horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! A uh, is the first syllable. It's unstressed. Horse is the next syllable, and it's stressed. That's an iamb right there. Notice that these marks signify whether a syllable is stressed or unstressed. The little u mark means the syllable is unstressed, and the plain old straight mark means that the syllable is stressed. Okay, on with the show. The next syllable, a, uh, unstressed, is followed by horse, which is stressed. It's like deja vu. This is another iamb. The same holds true for the rest of the line. My king is an iamb, and so is dumb four. Notice that we're not concerned with where words begin or end. This is all about syllables. And then it's back to a horse for our final iamb. Now you can see how this line of poetry gets its rhythm from all these terrific iams. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. So the iambic and iambic pentameter just means that the poetry contains iams. Ah, but what about pentameter? Well, all we have to do is break it down. Penta, that means five, and meter, that's what we've been talking about. Meter is a regular rhythmic pattern in language. Putting it together, we have five meters, or more technically, five metrical feet. The meter here is the iam. So in a line of iambic pentameter poetry, we have five iams. Our line from Richard III, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, is written in perfect iambic pentameter because it has five iams. Now you know all about blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter. Feel free to use your newfound knowledge of iambic pentameter to impress your friends and neighbors. I really love this rhythmic prose stuff. I, I think I'm going to speak it all the time. A pen, a pen, my kingdom for a pen. <laughs> Okay, we should probably address two things before we move on. One, why in the world did Shakespeare write in blank verse anyway? And two, how important is all this blank verse, iambic pentameter stuff? Number one, why did Shakespeare write in blank verse, also known as unrhymed iambic pentameter? Well, first off, we should say that not every line of Shakespeare is in perfect iambic pentameter. He does mix stuff up. Also, as we said, his plays aren't just written in poetry. Much of the works are written in prose, which, as you remember, is the opposite of poetry. And the reason why Shakespeare wrote in blank verse is just that he did. It was fairly common practice to write plays in this poetic form during the Elizabethan era. Playwrights chose this form because the rhythm of the iams in blank verse most closely resemble the natural rhythms of our speech. Believe it or not, a lot of the time we speak in iams. Now, we don't go up and down all the time like this, of course, but the underlying rhythm is unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. How about our second question? How important is all that blank verse iambic pentameter stuff? Well, you don't have to be a poetry expert to appreciate the rhythm and style of Shakespeare's language. Good blank verse will naturally appeal to and be pleasing to the ear. And Shakespeare, at his best, wrote not just good, but great verse. Shakespeare's plays are filled with poetry. The poetry is usually blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter. Iambic means containing iams. Iams are units of speech with an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Pentameter means five meters, which in this context means a line of poetry containing five iams. Now to really get an appreciation of why Shakespeare's plays are the way they are, we need to discuss three main differences between the drama of the English Renaissance and the drama you and I are used to seeing. They are, number one, the importance of words, number two, real life versus stage life, and number three, symbolic art. Let's start with number one, the importance of words. The importance of words. 
The theater was where drama in Shakespeare's time was presented, but it was a lot different than what we're used to today, say in our fancy movie theaters. For one, the Elizabethans didn't have any movies. No popcorn, no surround sound, no big guy who came in just before the movie starts and sat right in front of you. They didn't have that. Although the players in Shakespeare's theater company did the best they could, they didn't have many props or scenery at their disposal. They didn't have a lot of fancy costumes, just a bunch of stock costumes that they used over and over, and no elaborate lighting schemes. So Shakespeare used the best thing at his disposal, words. And Elizabethan audiences listened intently to his words. They didn't have any television or movies. They were used to listening to long stories and sermons. As we said before, Shakespeare's plays were performed during the daytime in open-air theaters within closing galleries. The stage was very simple, and the scenery was stock scenery, which had to work for all the different plays. And almost no special effects. Maybe one of those metal thunder sheets, and that was about it. The upshot of all this? Shakespeare's plays are primarily verbal, not visual. The playwright used words to express the setting and mood of the dramas. In Hamlet, the dark and ominous Who's midnight that? on the battlements is conveyed hey, through words. Ditto on the raging storm on the heath in the middle of King Lear. Shakespeare employed words to set the scene and the audience listened. Now we modern audiences, we're used to seeing everything. Be it in magazines, on the television, or at the movies, we respond to the visual. You know, even though Shakespeare wrote his plays in this heightened poetic language, Joe Elizabethan didn't speak this way. Thou and thine, dust haste, post haste, fardels to bear. <laughs> Tis thee and thine in the other thing me thinks. <laughs> shackle me, shackle me. Of course, maybe. I'm shackled. Don't let all the thous and thines discourage you, or any other part of that weird language in Shakespeare's plays. Most editions of his plays have glossaries that explain all the difficult words. So if you get stuck on the meaning of a word, check the glossary. Now, good drama can be made with an emphasis on the visual, which the movies use, or with an emphasis on words, which is what theater plays rely on. One is not necessarily better than the other, but the theater usually requires that the spectators use their imaginations more. That's the first main difference between our drama and the Elizabethans, the importance of words. The second main difference can be described as real life versus stage life. Real life versus stage life. When we go to the theater, we realize that the play we're watching is a fantasy. But the lines get blurred these days in the celebrity-driven culture of ours, especially in the cinema. The movies, as some call them. Movies tend to suggest that everything is real, especially the place and the people. We all know that they're not, but Hollywood tries very hard to present these movie characters as actual living people, even though they are only illusions of actual living people. If the characters in a movie are supposed to be rich people in a mansion, we expect them to look like rich people, and we expect to see the mansion. That's not the emphasis in a Shakespeare play. This means the characters are always understood to be characters. Extremely well drawn and conceived ones, but characters nonetheless. They're not real people, but figures that represent people. We'll see how this fits in with symbolic art, which we'll discuss later. This means that if something's not in the play, or referred to in the play, then it didn't happen. And if something about a character in the play isn't in the play or mentioned in the play, then it isn't part of their character. This helps us when we start to study the plays. Now, there are three main ways to gather information and gain insight into a character. One, by what they say. Two, by what others say about them. And three, by what they do. Take Hamlet, the character. He may seem almost real, but he doesn't exist apart from what is in the play. So as readers of the play, we shouldn't, for instance, wonder what kind of relationship Hamlet had as a child with his mother because it's not presented in the play. Similarly, we needn't wonder what Macbeth likes for breakfast. So, how do we analyze a character in one of Shakespeare's plays? Well, we go back to our three ways of gathering information about a character. One, by what they say. Two, by what others say about them. And three, by what they do. And that means sticking to the text. If we direct our attention to just one place, the actual word Shakespeare wrote, then we know we're not making anything up when we study and analyze his plays. 
Now this is different from what a theatrical company tries to do when they produce a Shakespeare play. It's their job to interpret and if they want to update these plays. So a particular production might do things that aren't expressly in the play. They might remove lines from a play or even remove entire characters. Or they may even set the play on the moon and dress all the characters in spacesuits. Copy that, Houston. To be or not to be, that is the question. Over. So, of course, we all know that the characters on stage are not real. But sometimes that distinction is lost in our modern-day forms of entertainment. Aristotle knew all of this to be true, that life on the stage is just an illusion. He also described tragedy as an imitation of an action. Who was this guy? Well, Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher, was like Shakespeare, a classic overachiever. During the 4th century BC, I studied under Plato, then opened up my own school of philosophy, the Lyceum. In between, I developed my own system of logic and wrote groundbreaking works on ethics, rhetoric, and politics. Oh yeah, and in my spare time, I tutored that young upstart, Alexander the Great. I'm so great. Aristotle also wrote The Poetics, in which he spelled out his ideas on tragedy. According to Aristotle, drama, including tragedy, is an imitation of an action. This is just Greek philosopher speak for saying what we've been saying. That life in a play is not real life, it's an imitation. We'll meet Aristotle again later when we explore his ideas on tragedy. That's the second difference between our modern drama and the Elizabethan's drama. Real life versus stage life. Now let's look at the third major difference. Symbolic art. Symbolic art. Shakespeare and his buddies were very influenced by the medieval art. Medieval art was deeply symbolic. This means that it focused on universals by presenting them through particulars. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll give you some examples so you'll understand what we mean by symbolism, universals, and particulars. Say we have a villain in a play, running around doing all sorts of bad stuff. Well, in a symbolic work of art, that villain wouldn't just be one bad guy. He would represent evil in the world. This is symbolism in action. The universal is evil, and it's presented in the particular, the villain. Here's another way to think of it. You know all those medieval and renaissance paintings that have the saints with halos? We know we're not supposed to take that gold ring literally and wonder how it stays up behind the person's head. No, we take it figuratively as a symbol of the saint's holiness. In this case, the universal is holiness or goodness, and the particular is the saint with the halo. In addition to good and evil, other universals are truth, beauty, justice, and purity. Symbolism, in this case, is how universals are presented through particulars. How did Shakespeare use such symbolism in his plays? Well, there's that raging storm in King Lear. Okay, it is an actual storm, so that's the particular. Now, in a universal sense, it symbolizes the storm raging inside King Lear's mind, as well as the universe reacting to Lear's violation of moral order. That's symbolism a la Shakespeare. Let's review. There are three main differences between Elizabethan drama and the drama we're used to today. The importance of words, real life versus stage life, and symbolism. The Elizabethan theater was a very word-oriented medium because theater companies didn't have a lot of fancy costumes, sets, props, scenery, or special effects at their disposal. That's why Shakespeare's plays are so word-heavy. The second difference is what we call real life versus stage life. The characters in these plays are not real. They're what Aristotle described as illusions. This distinction between real life and stage life is sometimes blurred in our culture. Symbolic art was very popular during the Elizabethan era. Symbolism is when the universal is presented through the particular, meaning that we have particular characters in a play that represent different universals, like good, evil, truth, and justice, for instance. Well, that does it for now. Thanks for watching Standard Deviant School of Shakespeare. I bid thee farewell.